so good to see everyone this morning. No doubt there are visitors. There may be some viewing uh, who may have questions about the things we do here. It's our heart's desire to always do things in accordance with God's Word. God is a spirit. They that worship Him must worship Him in spirit and in truth. It's our desire to do all things by the authority of our Lord and Savior as recorded in the New Testament of Jesus Christ. If you have any questions about anything you hear, anything that's said, we welcome your questions and we will do the very best we can to give you a scriptural answer for the questions you may have. Now, Brother Ray announced my name is Kelly Rowe. I've not met all of you uh, living in Humboldt right now. And a couple of years ago, we transplanted from Arkansas to Tennessee. I preached throughout much of northeast Arkansas for a number of years, filling in at different congregations. Uh, I preached, I was the associate minister at Greensboro Road Church of Christ in Jonesboro, Arkansas. And most recently, I preached at uh, Broadway Street Church of Christ in Mark Tree, Arkansas. And you may have heard they had an earthquake at Mark Tree last night. I think it was like 3.6 or something. I haven't heard about any damage. But uh, I haven't really talked to anyone over there either. It is a pleasure to be with you. It's su such a joy to gather together with those of like precious faith and worship our Lord and Savior, to worship God Almighty. In a very troubled world, I suppose the joy is even sweeter. I marvel that some have so little appetite to worship God Almighty. That's one of the things we're going to do on the other side. We make it to heaven. And it's a great joy, an unmixed joy, to worship the God who made us, the God who loves us, the God who sent His Son to die for our sins. It's such a blessing. And I pray that we will never have that right to assemble and worship God according to the commands of the New Testament taken from us again. It's a great joy to be with you in the presence of our Lord. Brethren, the church is the greatest institution on earth. Nations rise and nations fall, and I fear for many years our own nation is in the process of crumbling. I don't know. The scriptures do warn that the wicked shall be turned to hell and all the nations that forget God. Psalm 9, verse 7. And I'm afraid in very large part many in our nation, certainly in the leadership, have pretty much turned their backs on God Almighty. And there is a law of sowing and reaping. But brethren, the church, again, is the greatest institution in the world. Someday there may no longer be a United States as we know it. I don't know. I'm no prophet. Someday I know the scriptures teach that the world itself will be destroyed. The very elements melted with fervent heat, 2 Peter 3, chapter 3, by verse 10, I believe. Heaven and earth shall pass away, but my word shall not pass away, is what the Lord taught us. The book of Matthew, about chapter 24, 25, it's there. But the kingdom of Christ, the kingdom of God, endures. And our citizenship is in heaven. The kingdom we're a member of will endure forever. Isaiah 9, verse 7 prophesied, of the increase of his government, that is Christ God's, of the increase of his government there shall be no end. The work and the worship of the church must continue. And yes, there may be times we may be forced in some very difficult situations, but the scriptures are very clear. We must obey God rather than men. God overrules all. And one day, all great and small will stand before that great judge. And those who have shaken their fist in God's face will be humble. That's the God we serve. And it's God's desire that all men be saved and come to the knowledge of the truth. And that's the topic of the sermon this morning. Sorry we don't have a PowerPoint. Next week, Brother Ray will be back.
for you visitors, Brother Ramey back in the pool with, Lord willing. But the topic of the sermon is winning souls. And the work of the church is primarily to preach the gospel. Winning souls. The scriptures teach us in Proverbs 11, verse 30, He that winneth souls is wise. Why is that wise? Why shall it profit a man if he gain the whole world and lose his own soul? The soul of one individual is more precious than all the wealth in the world. How great God's love is for mankind. He so greatly desires that all men be saved, come to the knowledge of the truth. He sent his only begotten Son, the only one of his kind, to redeem fallen man. How precious is each soul. We look in the world around us and those outside of Christ, brethren, I think sometimes we, we forget. Those outside of Christ are lost. They're outside of the body of Christ. The church of Christ. The Christ's blood does his, its benefit in his body just like in my own body, my blood does its good in this body. Enter ye in the straight gate, wide as the gate, broad as the way that leads to destruction, and many there be which go in therein. And most are going that great broad way. Life is short. Death is certain. If you live to be 105, that's really not that long. And not many will make it that long. Most are lost. God desires that all men be saved. He doesn't want anyone to be lost. He is long-suffering to us, not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. It's so important to God. Is it important to me? And this morning, we we'll look at three points relating to this topic of winning souls. It's a duty, it's a privilege, some ways, and thoroughly why some expend so little effort in this greatest of all works. Yet one day, all the, the world itself will be destroyed. But the work of winning souls, that's going to carry on into eternity. First off, it's a duty, it's a privilege Take the gospel to the world so desperately needs it. Go ye therefore and teach all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all things whatsoever commanded you. And lo, I am with you always, even to the end of the world. Go preach the gospel to every creature. He that believeth and is baptized shall be saved. He that believeth not shall be condemned. Now I know our Lord was speaking specifically to the apostles. But the apostles are no longer walking on the face of this earth. That charge is ours, the church. What a privilege to be part of this great work. Thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, with all thy soul, with all thy mind, with all thy strength. And thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. I don't want to lose my soul. How concerned am I with my neighbor? Brethren, it's our wisdom to take a genuine interest in others. A genuine interest in other people. And do we do that? I'm not simply trying to win an argument, I'm right and you're wrong. But we're trying to save their soul. And we must warn them of the eternal consequences of, of, of dying outside of Christ. And what a tragedy it is to die outside of Christ. But, but, but do you ever stop to consider what a tragedy it is to live outside of Christ? You're robbing yourself. Sin is such a cheat. The peace, the happiness, the unmixed joy of walking faithfully with the Lord and Savior Jesus Christ every day. I 
I have a difficult time grasping the concept of eternity. All around me, things begin, things end, and I think I just lost my power. Things begin, here we are. Things end. Forever. Forever with our Lord and Savior, forever in hell. Forever tormented. And knowing you had a Savior, knowing you didn't have to be there, forever. We must mourn. I, I, I marvel that the great lengths people go to to succeed in this life, whatever that, by whatever measure they, they consider success, gathering great wealth, great power, and how little effort is expended in being right with God, in being prepared spiritually. How many people have ever read this book through once in their entire lives? And how many just go on with whatever their preacher, their pastor, their mom, their dad, their grandma, their grandpa, someone told them? How many expend the effort to search, to seek out the book of the Lord and read and see for yourself what the truth is? If you continue my word, you're my disciples and me, and you shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. Eternal consequences of dying lost. But through Jesus Christ, we offer the greatest of all gifts to men. Forgiveness. All of sin that comes short of the glory of God. Redemption. Fellowship. blessing to walk faith with my Lord and Savior each day and to know that when I leave this world, and I will, that there truly is something better waiting for me on the other side. I go and prepare a place for you. That where I am, there you may be also. And the blessings in Christ are inexhaustible. All can be saved. The door is wide open. And our Lord and Savior pleads with men to come into His body, to His church. Inexhaustible blessings. Living waters. There's plenty for all. It's not in short supply. All can come. Sometimes folks are so hardened in sin that well, the Lord can't forgive a sinner like a yes, He can. If you can bring yourself to repent. Those very individuals that put our Lord and Savior to death on the cross. Remember Jesus' prayer on the cross? Father, forgive them for they don't know what they do. In Acts chapter 2, you saw the gospel being preached in its fullness, and no doubt some of that crowd were right there crying out, crucify, crucify. And they had the opportunity to obey the gospel commands and be forgiven of literally putting Jesus to death. That's the God we serve. He is so gracious. He is so merciful. And He pleads with men to repent. And I dare say if our Lord was literally walking the face of this earth today, He'd be preaching that same sermon He preached so long ago. Repent! Repent. A world that so desperately needs to repent. What a privilege to win souls for Christ. 2 Corinthians 6 1 states that we are laborers together with Him. What a marvelous thing to be able to work with our Lord in that sense. Have you ever had the privilege of working with somebody that was very expert and very good at what they did? We're laborers together with Him. You know, work that will endure. I marvel sometimes again when I, I see all the great architecture, I see the great buildings in the, in, in the large cities. And every time I go across the Mississippi River Bridge there at the, on the way out to Dyersburg, I guess it's the Cape Girardeau, uh, Carruthersville Bridge, I, I slow down if I can. And I marvel. How did they do this? The effort. 
the ingenuity, the danger, the skill of crossing that span of water in that muddy Mississippi, go down south of the Gulf, and man, there's some bridges that are so long. How do they do these things? One day all these works will be gone. But the work of saving souls, that what, what was done, that effort extended, that extends into eternity itself. What a privilege to teach the good news of salvation. That the Son of God died for our sins. He was buried, but He arose. And by obeying the gospel commands, we can be saved. We have a Savior. And the golden rule also requires whatsoever you would that men should do to you, do even so to them. This is the law and the prophets, Matthew 7, verse 12. Friend, if I'm lost, I sure wish somebody would reach out to me. I was blessed to be born into a family of, of God-fearing parents. But I still have to be taught. And no doubt some of you know, or maybe even in your own family, You've seen it yourself that sometimes children born to some of these families become rebellious. There's a choice you have to make. To accept the gospel commands or reject them. Some hows. Well, one of the ways of winning souls is, is times like right now where we're assembled together. Preaching the gospel. And I pray that we can never be free to preach the gospel without fear of, of uh, being censored, of being harmed in any way. But I recall a few years back, I believe it was in Houston, the mayor there, one of the, the, the local preachers, said, I want to copy your sermon. I want to see what you want to preach on. Make sure you're not preaching anything we don't want you to preach. And some of the things going on in our nation today, I wonder... Many years ago, I, I, I've often wondered, one of these days, I'm going to get hauled out of the pulpit for preaching. There may come a day where the church is not free to assemble like it is right now. Talk about separating the wheat from the chaff. It can happen. Jesus taught large crowds, such as the Sermon on the Mount. Again, in assemblies like this, gospel meetings, and I think one of the things I, I, I hate so bad about the times we're living in, gospel meetings. What a marvelous opportunity to invite our friends and neighbors to come and see, come and hear. Not much of that going on these days. We can teach through radio, television, the internet. And yes, you got to be careful with the internet. They can, they can uh, pull your freedom to speak. They don't like what you're saying. They can stop it. We teach publicly. Our Lord did. But we can also preach and teach privately. The day may come when we are censored and our, we, may be not, we may not be free to assemble like this. But we can still teach privately, personally. And the job of winning souls is not just for the race. It's not just the preachers. I look out and I see a crowd of probably at least 100. The preachers can't count, maybe 150. Each one has a circle of friends you can influence friends, neighbors, relatives, people you associate with, people that only you may be able to reach with the gospel of Jesus Christ. Are you doing it? Are you preparing yourself to do it? The early disciples did personal work. Andrew went to find his brother, Simon Peter, John 1, verse 40. The apostles daily in the temple and in every house they cease not to teach and preach Jesus Christ. In Acts chapter 8, the church of Jerusalem was scattered except the apostles. And they went everywhere preaching the word. That was the members. 
And again, we hate the idea of persecution, but at least in that case, it actually furthered the spread of the gospel of Jesus Christ. And we can read passages like, well, they, they were scattered. You ever stop to consider what would happen if, if we all had to move, we had to leave? The persecution became so great. How hard is it just up and move? I've lived here all my life. Many of you may say, my family, my friends, my relatives, my means of making an income. They're here. The early church was scattered. But the gospel grew. And in fact, it seemed as though the more the church was persecuted, the greater the church grew. Again, there's that great separation between the wheat and the chaff. Those who were serious about it, who this truly is your vocation. What do you do? I'm a Christian. Whether you're a plumber or you're a farmer, you're a truck driver, you're a doctor, you're a lawyer, my main vocation is I'm a Christian. That's how I identify myself. And that's how I want my Lord to see me. Philip the Evangelist was called away from a great work he was doing with those Samaritans to teach the Ethiopian treasure in Acts chapter 8. Paul of the Ephesian elders would write, it's noted in Acts chapter 20, that he taught publicly and from house to house. Consider Cornelius, the first Gentile convert. He was so eager to hear what the Apostle Peter had to say that he called his friends, his near kinsmen, to hear the gospel. That should be our mindset. Matthew had tax collectors and sinners dine with him in his house with Jesus and his apostles. Jesus himself did personal work. And again, this is one thing that we can all do. Only the men are able to have the authority, you should say, to do what I'm doing right now. And I marvel that a lot of so-called churches, they, they seem to be bragging about having women preachers. Have you read your Bible? For women to keep silent in the churches? To not usurp authority over the men? Well, that didn't apply to me. Really? All can do personal work or learn to do it. Jesus did personal work. It was to Nicodemus that he made this statement. Except a man be born of water and the Spirit, he cannot enter into the kingdom of God. I think of the Samaritan woman at the well of Sychar in John chapter 4. He taught that lesson on living water. He started that conversation by asking her to do something for him. He said, give me to drink which gave him the opportunity to truly help her. You know, sometimes you can help someone best by letting them help you. Have you ever tried to work with someone that uh, they didn't want to show you anything? They just did. Like, get out of my way. Especially for a child, when you have an adult father or mother, and they are a little, little child, and they're asking you, little child, Hey, can you help me? That, that they think you're worthy to help them. Sometimes you can help people best by letting them help you. And Jesus took something of common interest to both of them and made it a topic of conversation. They were both there to get water. And that ordinary conversation led to that woman becoming a disciple of Christ. Just an ordinary conversation. The scriptures teach in Matthew 12, verse 34. Out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speak. Ask most folks about something that they're very familiar with. Ask many about what kind of work they're in. Ask them about their kids or their grandkids and they'll talk 
a young person that's an athlete, ask him how the team's doing. How are you doing? Making any touchdowns lately? And they'll open up and they'll talk. Because these things are near and dear to their hearts. What should be more near and dear to my heart than the gospel of Jesus Christ? Out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaketh. What's in our hearts? Do I love others enough to get personal with them? Do I see the need of a precious soul that's outside of Christ, that's outside of his body, and that's lost? Do I see the need? And do I see the potential of what that person can be? I think of that woman at the well. The scriptures teach that the woman had had five husbands, and the man that she was living with was not her husband. Would I look at such an individual and just say, that person's not a good candidate for obeying the gospel? They'll never obey. Jesus didn't. An ordinary conversation led to that woman becoming a disciple. And that woman, in turn, she went to the towns to come see a man that told me all things ever that I did. She wanted them to hear this man. Can we see the potential? And truly, God sees what we can be. We can become children of God, washed clean by the blood of Jesus Christ. Those that old man of sin can be dead and gone. He can be a new creature in Jesus Christ. Do we see the potential? Again, as we look around the people we know, how can I reach them? Can you even start by praying for them and praying for wisdom? How can I best approach this person? Amongst your circle of friends, your family, your relatives, the people you do business with. Can we open up? Do we have the courage to talk to us, to ask them questions? Are you a Christian? Where do you go to church? Why do you go there? Does it matter which church you go to? Are you saved? How were you saved? Can we ask folks these questions? Get them to talk and listen. And I've known a lot of religious people that don't listen too well. Want to talk? They won't listen. Where's this person at? Are they a believer in Jesus Christ? And start there. Where do I need to start? Again, pray for wisdom. Pray for wisdom. And listen to them. Asked a man one time if he was saved, and, and, and he said, well, how were you saved? And the man told me, I had a warm feeling come over me. I was in Bible class, and I just knew right then I was saved. And I said, well, well, can we see what the Bible says, what God says we must do to be saved? shall likewise perish. Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, for mission of sins, and you shall receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. There's an awful lot of folks that have been baptized, but they've never been baptized scripturally. For one spirit, you all baptized into one body. If a person is scripturally baptized, the Bible says the Lord asked the church daily that you should be saved. The Lord himself is going to add you to his church. We also teach, and I'm almost done, <laughs> by the manner of our life. Let your light so shine before men. They may see your good works and glorify your Father which is in heaven. The hypocrisy, the sin in my own life, don't you know that hinders 
my efforts to reach others, especially when they know me? Well, you put on a pretty good show, but I know you. I know what you were doing Friday night. I know what you were doing at work. We need to get our own house in order. Hypocrisy, the sin in our own lives will destroy much good. It creates a great hindrance to teaching others. The scriptures teach in Ecclesiastes 9, 18, one sin destroyeth much good. But lastly, some excuses why more is not being done by myself, by others, to not win souls. We may reason, well, they won't believe it anyway. Think of Moses, who had become one of the great leaders of all time. He stated in Exodus 4, verse 1, They will not believe me, nor hearken unto my voice. No, all will not hearken. All will not obey the gospel. Do you ever stop to consider that even Jesus himself did not convert everyone that he taught? The apostles didn't convert everyone they taught. But I am. There's a personal responsibility. Some will accept the gospel, some will reject it. Our duty, our privilege, our command is to go and teach. To water, to plant, excuse me, plant to water. God will give the increase. And brethren, I believe there are still those with honest and good hearts out there who will obey the gospel. I know it's overcast today, but the sun came up again today. We're still in this world. The Lord's not yet returned. There's still hope. And I believe one of the reasons, I, I believe that's an indication there are still people who will obey the gospel. I believe there are still folks with honest and good hearts that will accept the gospel commands. Look at me in your Bibles, 2 Thessalonians chapter 2. We read of some who will not receive the love of the truth that they might be saved. 2 Thessalonians 2, verses 11 and 12. And for this cause God shall send them strong delusion, that they should believe a lie, that they all might be damned and believe not the truth, but had pleasure in unrighteousness. Again, the command is for us to teach. And trust in God to give the increase. Some may not teach because they, they lack the knowledge. Well, the solution for that is simple enough. Start studying your Bible. I wonder sometimes how many even in the church have ever read this book through one time their whole life. I don't know. I don't know about you, but I read it. And I read it. And I read it over and over. You know, and I forget things. And it's always so refreshing. Oh, I've I, I forgotten about that story. And, and God's Word, it, it is, it's an inexhaustible treasure. The lessons that you can glean from God's Word are inexhaustible. It seems like I'm forever finding new lessons in His Word. And it's as fresh today as it was the day it was penned. It's just as applicable to mankind. It tells us of God. It tells us where we came from. It tells us how to live. It tells us where we're going. Tell us how to get there. An inexhaustible treasure. In our world today, it's often very difficult to know whether what you're being told is true or not. Sanctify them through thy truth. Thy word is truth. This is rock solid. You can stake your life on it. You can stake your moral soul. And we've got to know it. We've got to know God's word for when you're teaching. But some may not be teaching because of a lack of love for the lost. And the solution is to examine yourself. And I know sometimes as we seek to teach others, we may be mocked, we may be scorned, we may be ridiculed. Brethren, this is the greatest work on earth to teach.
teach the gospel. What a privilege, what an honor to be laborers together with Christ. What shall I render unto the Lord for all his benefits toward me? The psalmist would ask. This is one thing I can do. And you may be the one person that can reach someone that no one else can reach. You've got to be walking faithfully with Christ. They need to be seeing in your life that you're genuine. You need to be walking with Him. Faithfully. Because the sins in our lives, they hinder our, our, our efforts to reach others. And we've got to have enough love for the lost to seek them. To teach the gospel. The Son of Man has come to seek and save that which is lost. That's, that's what we do too. 